<clears throat> well, um, perhaps we might uh, make a start. Great to see so many happy, smiling faces at quarter past five on a Tuesday evening. And I know why you're here, and I know why you're happy and smiling, because you're here to welcome Graham Crow. So my name's Joe Shaw, I'm director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, and I was deputy head of college, and I think that's why I've been asked to chair some inaugural lectures this year, but it's always an enormous pleasure to do that because I think it's one of the most fabulous things that the college and the university does to celebrate the excellence of um, its staff. So uh, Professor Graham Crow is the uh, chair of, of sociology and, and methodology, and he tells me that he takes pretty much um, an exhaustive approach to using different methodologies, or as one reviewer perhaps recently said, an exhausting approach uh, to doing that. But uh, I've already, uh, in the short time I've just been talking to Graham, of course having met him before, but talking to him about his inaugural, come to appreciate what a self-deprecating sense of humor um, he has. Uh, but nonetheless, <clears throat> this is a very serious occasion, as well as a joyful occasion. Uh, Graham Crow came to us from uh, the University of Southampton, where he held a, a chair of sociology right up to December 2012, so he's been with us just over a year. Um, and prior to that, he took his uh, MA and uh, PhD in sociology at the University of Essex with his PhD in 1987 on the topic of family farming, where he tells me that uh, doing not as he says, but rather as he does, he chose a single method approach, uh, so rather than a mixed methods approach. But since then, of course, he's become a great advocate for the um, importance of mixed methods. Uh, since then, uh, after his 30 years at the University of Southampton, having come to the um, University of, of Edinburgh, he's made huge contributions uh, to, to our work already through his role as, um, uh, as, as the, uh, in, in relation to the, um, uh, the uh, uh, graduate school in, in social science. But more than anything else, I think he's, he's, he's most known for his role, his career highlight of um, helping or leading the team running the 2008 and 2010 ESRC research methods festivals and um, as deputy director of the National Center for Research Methods. And he's pulled together in that context enormous um, meetings of seven to 800 delegates over four days. That's pretty impressive for an academic. It's definitely something to put on your CV. His other interests include gardening, and in, t in the past until he discovered, he says that they didn't combine keeping chickens. And uh, his partner, Rose Wiles, is in the audience um, and we welcome her here from Southampton as well. Uh, he first came to Edinburgh in 1988 for a conference which was organized by a team inclu uh, including some of his current colleagues in sociology, Lim Jamieson and David McCrone. And he's enjoyed many more fruitful visits to Edinburgh until he discovered that this was actually the place to come and stay. So uh, we've got uh, time for, uh, plenty of time for, for um, uh, Graham's lecture, and then there will be an opportunity to ask him some questions if you wish to do so before we'll, um, hopefully, you will all join us for a, a glass of wine or something else in order to celebrate Graham's achievement. So thank you very much. Uh, please welcome Graham Crow. Uh, thank you, Joe. I I um, will try to live up to that. Uh, I thought that on these occasions, what often happens is that people sit right at the back. So I, I thought I'd put up this slide that I have here um, to encourage people to come to the front to see if they could read what is the sign on the gate. This is Willow Bed Farm. Uh, and it, it was taken in 1980 when I was out doing my PhD fieldwork. Uh, it's probably not a good enough definition for you to be able to see it, but uh, I do still have the photograph if any of you want to check, and it says, trespassers will be shot. <laughs> I'll come back to Willow Bed Farm uh, a bit later on. What I want to do in this talk is to uh, talk to the theme about the benefits of uh, making use of the variety of methods that we have, and to do that by just saying something, first of all, about my PhD research in the 1980s then to say something about the field of community, which is my area of research in particular, um, as a field in which methodological pluralism 
uh, has been present for some time. It's a field where it's had a mixed, checkered history, but I want to argue that despite some of the criticisms that were leveled at, the, uh, at, at that body of work, uh, nevertheless, responses to that by researchers in the field have led to it having a vibrant present. I then want to say something about an exemplar of mixed methods research, bringing together a range of different uh, approaches, although I'm conscious that uh, there, there is uh, a person in the audience, Claire Wallace, who knows much more about this particular case study than I do, so uh, Claire may correct some of the things I say uh, at, at the end. Then to return to uh, Willowbed Farm and uh, end with some acknowledgements. So I'll try and do that in the space of, of less than an hour to allow time for questions and, and discussion. I'm very happy to have comments uh, as, well as, as well as questions. So Willowbed Farm, uh, when I was doing my fieldwork in 1980 uh, in the eastern half of Kent, I was cycling round. I had the ambition, that which I eventually achieved, of uh, a sample of 100 family farmers to interview. Uh, I was cycling along just south of Ashford in Kent and, uh, and saw this sign, did a double take, and thought, I'll take a photograph of that. I wasn't inspired to try and go and knock on the door and recruit this person into the sample uh, on the grounds that I was somewhat intimidated by, by this. Um, but I did go on to, uh, to uh, it may have been on this day, I'm not sure, but I did go on to a farm with the name uh, Culloden Farm. That sticks in my mind as another sort of high point of the, of the fieldwork process. I was following a fairly conventional interview uh, schedule of questions and I asked the uh, farmer fairly early on uh, what his thoughts were about uh, social class and what class he'd put himself in. And he said, well, of course, it depends whether you take a Weberian or a Marxist approach to class. <laughs> and I thought, I've entered a parallel universe. <laughs> Uh, only later, at the end of the interview, did he tell me that his brother is a well-known sociologist. I should have sort of perhaps made the connection through the name and that he was having a joke at my expense. Uh, but uh, the, the, the um, experience of fieldwork is always unpredictable and, and that, uh, that has stayed with me. And, and, and when I meet with him eventually, I will have a word with his brother for setting me up in that way. So my fieldwork took me to various um, places and it was... I now look back, I have the thesis here. It was, uh, and if any of you are kind of wanting a distraction during the talk, just come and get it. Um, but one of the things I want to say is that it was uh, based entirely on the collection and analysis of interview data. And although I had my camera with me and was taking photographs like the one of Willowbed Farm, they don't actually feature in the thesis. And uh, I think it's one of those things where looking back, it would have been a better thesis if I had used a variety of methods, including uh, the use of, of the photographs that I, that I took uh, in, the course of, uh, in the course of going, going round. And also some of the other things that, that I remember from the period where I didn't really feel that they should go into the thesis, but looking back, I wish they had. So hearing, for example, just the story of uh, one of the relatives of, of one of the people I interviewed who had uh, gone off to the First World War. Um, he had joined the Navy. His four brothers had joined the Army. His four brothers had all been killed. He had survived and had come back and had never left the village that he was in since that, since that time. And these kind of oral hist history uh, stories, I think, would have helped to provide a richer context than I was able to give through the, uh, through, through the interview data. So um, I've used interview material in my PhD research. I've used it in, in subsequent uh, pieces of research that I did, and I'm not making the case that interviews are bad. I think interviews have their place, but they're not the only method. Just to kind of confirm that interviews can generate interesting and useful and engaging data, um, one of the studies was a study looking at the relations between neighbors, and uh, in the course of this uh, project, um, our interviewer asked one of the uh, participants about uh, her patterns of friends and we were asking whether friends lived locally or not and so uh, she was asked when she had talked about a particular individual does she live locally is she local and the reply from this person who lived in Ventnor on the Isle of Wight uh, was oh no she's from Roxall now 
Ventnor is down here at the bottom. <coughs> Roxall is all of two miles up the road. And to her, that's not local. And that sticks in my mind as a very kind of important uh, pointer that my sense of what local is and this, uh, this participant's sense of what local is are two very different things. So this fairly straightforward question about uh, placing people in terms of locality can tell us something about people's worlds, people's sense of how we fit in. In the same study, uh, in, in another uh, interview, our, 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 our researcher asked a question about have you ever had any trouble with your neighbours? And this is the response. I'll, I'll read it out. We did actually have someone you know who used to beat his partner up quite violently and you try to turn a blind eye, don't you? So imagine yourself in the position of the poor researcher who is faced with how do you respond to a question like that? You, she's just been told that, that uh, the neighbour is beating his wife up and uh, you ignore it, don't you? Do, you? do you kind of sort of say, yes, I would do exactly the same as that or do you kind of get into a discussion and disrupt the flow of the, the interview in, in, in that way? Um, you just listen to it because in this house, you can't help that, it was a terraced house, uh, at two or three o'clock in the morning. Then he started doing it early in the evening when the children were awake, so we had no choice but to call the police. It's none of our business, but when the children are in, then that's something else, isn't it? We assumed it was drink. And I've used this a lot in my teaching about methods to get people to think about the sorts of situations you find yourself in uh, when you are collecting data, because what do you do when you're confronted with this? And also, what, what does this tell us about the nature of neighbour relations? It tells us something about privacy, it tells us something about um, social responsibility, and it tells us a lot about the knowledge that we have of our neighbours that we kind of bracket out in, in some ways. So I'm certainly saying that interviews can generate interesting data, but I want to go on and say that interviews are only one of many, many methods that are available to us as, as researchers. And so in my new role that, that Joe was talking about as director of the Scottish Graduate School of Social Science, uh, one of the things I find myself saying or giving as advice is, don't do as I did in my thesis and use just one method. Do as I say. I sound very parental about this, but that, that's, I guess, you know, one of the things that comes with age. And, uh, and, and, and the message is very much consider using more than one method. There's a whole world of methods out there to be, uh, a whole, whole field of methods out there to be, to be used. And if you use only one, your study may well be the poorer for that. And it wasn't as if I didn't have the suggestion staring me in the face. So when I was doing uh, my research, I was aware of a whole range of, a whole range of pieces of research that had been done that had used a, a variety of different methods and each of them, in their, in their ways, had the potential to make my thesis better by broadening it out and making it a mixed methods uh, piece of research. And I just want to note um, that much of this community research uh, has been undertaken in Scotland. The slides I'm going to show are just of a, a small selection of books that have come out that have uh, used a variety of methods other than uh, interviews, or maybe in addition to interviews. So um, Jim Hunter's The Making of the Crofting Community is one which has done excellent, uh, excellent service to the value of research using archives, uh, looking at the history of um, the development of the crofting community. Oral history is another method that's available to researchers in the field of community. Uh, not all of the fieldwork for this particular study was done in Scotland, but enough of it was. I was a student at Essex at the time, and I remember Paul Thompson saying, do you know anyone who has uh, any, uh, any background in Scotland? Because we've got some uh, tapes that have been collected by our field worker, and we can't understand what they're saying. <laughs> and in the end, uh, they were fortunate enough in Essex to also have a department of linguistics, and I think they recruited in a, uh, a linguistics person who was able to help them with the... Uh, with the interpretation of what was going on. Oral history is um, the basis for another piece of research by uh, Lynn Jameson and Claire Toynbee. Lynn, Lynn is in, in the audience, another fascinating study. This came out actually after my thesis uh, uh, was handed in, but nevertheless the research was going on, so the ideas could have been there if I'd put two and two together. Um, this study by uh, Tony Cohen uh, with Edinburgh Connections is a sort of is a, an anthropological ethnography based in uh, the Shetland Islands. The social impact of oil was already out when I was uh, writing up my thesis, and here Robert Moore 
went up the road from Aberdeen to Peterhead to investigate the politics and the, the planning decisions uh, by looking at documents and speaking to people about the political processes around the way in which Peterhead has, has been, had been at that time transformed by the arrival of the North Sea oil uh, industry. And there are some fairly rudimentary, but nevertheless, they're there, uh, ventures into social network analysis, um, which add to, the, add, add to the value of this particular, this particular study. Uh, and, uh, another of my favorites from uh, Scotland, again, published more, more recently than, than uh, the 1980s, uh, is this <coughs> ethnography and survey-based study of uh, a former mining community in the central belt, looking at masculinity and the responses to the decline of a, an occupational community. Um, Sean Damer's study uh, uses historical documents and interviews and ethnography and, uh, and also touches on this theme about um, the importance of understanding what people are saying. Uh, he's got the wonderful line in this book, Glaswegians do not speak English. I wasn't sure if that would get a laugh or not, but anyway. <laughs> um, perhaps more, more, more serious point is the study by George Ghiacci about the arrival of um, nuclear, uh, the nuclear base at Holy Loch in Argyllshire. And for this, uh, he says, this was a single-handed piece of research and he conducted no fewer than 803 interviews which you might think, well, that's eight, that's eight times more than you did for your thesis, so you might think that would be enough. But in fact, he also looked at uh, various media documents because there were, uh, um, there were political disputes and, and, and upheavals around this shift with, with the um, arrival of uh, the Polaris base and, and the conf conflicts around that. So not only interviews, but also looking at newspaper records and then, just finally, the whole lecture won't be like this, by the way. Um, <laughs> just a series of book covers. That would be very dull um, or unadventurous. But to, to the final one, just to show that, that had I looked north of the border and peered over Hadrian's Wall, I could have also thought that maybe there is great value in using ethnographic, uh, eth ethnographic material. So this is a classic ethnography uh, in, this, in this famous social science series of Routledge and Keegan Paul. Um, so all the encouragement was there, I just didn't take it up, and as I say, I think the thesis, although it's worthy, um, but it may be worthy and rather dull, relative to what it might have been had it had some of the other things by using these other, uh, these other methods available to me. So um, what I want to go on to now is to talk about five criticisms of traditional community research and the way in which um, in, in the field what we've seen is a number of expressions of dissatisfaction about the, the, the research uh, literature as it, as, it, as it developed, and some responses to that in the current century. So uh, Alice Ma and I had a small grant to look at uh, research reports done by the people um, into the field of community, broadly understood, uh, published since the year 2000, and to think about the methodological issues that are raised and to think about the way in which those people have responded to these criticisms of community research as being too parochial, too static, too positive, too descriptive, and too prosaic. So I'll say a bit about each of those lines of criticism and how uh, researchers in the field have responded to those criticisms using uh, a variety of methods available to them. And I want to say that, that the responses to these criticisms have drawn on uh, methodological innovations, and that's a particular interest that I and others um, have had about what the nature of methodological innovation is and its consequences for, uh, for the research process. So this slide is there for two reasons. One is to say that it is a slide from a book that came out in the early 1950s, the research was done in the 1940s. Uh, this was a study by a, a Welsh socio social geographer called Alwyn Rees, and this is a, a small parish in the north of Wales. The parish boundary is the dotted line, and it's a social network analysis 
drawn, I would imagine, with you know, a ruler and pencil, and I'll say a bit more about social network an analysis and how it's developed um, late, later on. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a diagrammatic representation of kinship networks. So Alwyn Reese's point is one that it's very important for field researchers to bear in mind, that if you're going into the field and doing research into community, and if people say to you, have you spoken with anyone else? And you say, yes, I've spoken to that chap down the road, mad as a hatter. Uh, you may well find that they say, that's my brother you're talking about. <laughs> so uh, beware the point that there is connectedness. This is a particularly densely connected network in uh, this North Wales um, community. There are very few dots. Dots mean uh, households. And there are very few dots that don't have some kinship connection with another household in this small, isolated uh, up upland Welsh community. So that's one point for mentioning it is that, um, kin that, uh, that social network analysis has been around for some time. This, this as I say, is over uh, uh, 60 years old. It's actually older than I am, this, this diagram. Um, and so when we hear about innovation and people say, I've just discovered this wonderful new method called social network analysis, we need to say, well, actually, maybe, yeah, it's great that you've discovered it, but you haven't discovered it in the sense that it's been around for some time. The other reason for putting this slide up is that it suggests that everything is happening within the boundaries of this parish. So this is an example of how some critics came to say community research is too parochial. It's looking only at the local connections. It's not looking at any of the connections between the people in this uh, particular place and the world outside. And that would be you know, a fair criticism of this, uh, of this particular diagram, although not of the study, because one of the things that Rees went on to do was to talk about patterns of out-migration, and he was very concerned about the migration of um, uh, younger people in particular from this rural uh, parish to the cities in, uh, in, in Wales and England and beyond. So on the point about whether community research is too parochial, is, is it just looking at things that are so local that you ask the question, so what? Well, certainly some researchers have continued to be quite localised in their focus, and lots of examples, um, I've just restricted myself to two here. One is Danny Miller's study of a street in South London where he's talking about the incredible diversity that's found there. But the one that I, I've got a, a, um, a, a, a map relating to is the second one by Suzanne Hall, who's again looking at a single road, it's the Walworth Road in, in <coughs> South London, and what she's saying is, we can learn a lot about the world by looking at this one street. And what she's done is to look at uh, this theme of transnational communities. And what she's done is she's put together on one slide the Walworth Road at the top and a map of the world at the bottom, and the lines between are the linkages between shop owners in the Walworth Road and where they've come from, where, where their point of departure in their pattern of migration has been. And so what this is saying is that if we want to understand who is part of this community in the Walworth Road, who is running shops in this part of South London, this is a story about the British Empire. We've got the West Indies here as the point of origin of several of the shopkeepers. We've got West Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, the um, South Asian subcontinent. We've got uh, Hong Kong is another one of those points of origin there. So in other words, this is a study of a particular street, but in no way is that parochial in, in, in my mind and in Suzanne Hall's mind. So I'm, I'm stealing her thunder there, but it's a fascinating way of showing that by looking at very localised uh, points of points of uh, focus, we can also at the same time make global connections. So I think that, that studies like this do meet the criticism that community research is, is rather parochial. Okay, second criticism is that uh, community research is too static, that it seems to just say, oh well, that's how things are, and they're, they're, you know, it, it seems like they're, they're telling us that things don't change. Tali Blockland's um, study on inner city Rotterdam does a similar thing to Suzanne Hall and looks at the points of, uh, looks at the patterns of migration from the former Dutch Empire in South America, 
America, South America, in Indonesia, and elsewhere, and, uh, and, and, and gives an account of how the, the uh, inner city Rotterdam has changed enormously in recent years with these patterns of migration. So whatever else it is, it's not a static account. In terms of methods, Andrew Clark, um, who was one of my uh, uh, colleagues through the, the National Center for Research Methods, produced a very interesting piece about the method of conducting interviews while walking around an area in, in Leeds in that particular case. And again, the, it's not a static picture because as you walk around, it prompts people and people give a sense of in, in, in their interview materials in response to all these prompts that they're getting about how things have changed in, uh, in, in their lifetime as, uh, as, as things go around. So that's the second. And then the third example is from Doug, Douglas Harper. Douglas Harper um, uses resources that were uh, funded by Standard Oil in the 1940s. Standard Oil were uh, not necessarily particularly popular in, uh, in, in the 1940s, and they came up with the idea that if they funded some uh, photography of how oil was essential to American agriculture, then people would hold them in a more favorable light. So in the 1940s, there's a wonderful collection of, uh, of photographs of different aspects of farming, um, and Douglas Harper then uh, contrasted those, set those up against some more photographs that he, uh, that, that he and his research team took in the period 50 years, 50 years on. I won't show them all, I'll just show one, but this is such a fascinating photograph. I think I've used this a lot in teaching. I quite often just put this up and say, what do you make of that? And, um, but I've been advised against doing that in this, in this format, so I won't do that. But uh, maybe some, we can come back to it in questions. But this is just uh, an example. This is um, upstate New York in 1945. This is a group of uh, men sat around a, a table. They've been helping each other out in terms of the threshing of wheat. And this was, uh, th th this was a, a sort of standard pattern. And this is how things were um, just less than uh, 70 years ago. So Harper is able to use photographs like this and take photographs more recently and say, look at how things have changed. Things have changed in enormous numbers of ways. And when I say, when I use this in teaching, sometimes people say, yes, look at the haircuts. Haven't haircuts changed? But I think there's also something there about you know, the gender, the, 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 the gender uh, nature of what's going on here. Some people also focus on the food that's on the table. So all sorts of things come up. But that's, that's the point that, that what we're seeing is all sorts of ways that people are relating to this photograph and seeing how things have changed. So, so if community research is static, well, it's not so in the hands of Douglas Harper's study. Other examples of change, just briefly to go through, uh, some studies of, of gentrification, the way in which people um, have transformed inner city areas in, uh, in, in various parts of the world uh, and, 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 and done so with a view to seeking to live among people like themselves, people like us. Another example at the bottom here is a restudy of uh, a classic piece of social science, Michael Young and Peter Wilmot's Family and Kinship in East London, which of all research in the field of community uh, is remarkable for the number of copies it sold. So it reached a very wide audience. And as we think about, uh, as we think about things like impact, then if you can sell half a million copies of something that you've, you've produced, then that's probably going to be an impact case study, I'm thinking. Uh, <laughs> um, and in this return to, the, to, 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 to this classic study, Jeff Dench and, and his colleagues, who included uh, Michael Young before, before he died, um, went back and found the new East End. They found a transformed situation. And in particular, one of the things that they found was that the heroine of the original study, this, this sort of matriarchal mother figure who was the holder of kinship networks in 1950s Bethnal Green, had uh, become somewhat different in terms of uh, in terms of what she, what, uh, what she was now doing in relation to what she said about the expansion of the Bangladeshi community. So this uh, is from, from the book by Jeff Dench and his colleagues. It shows the analysis of, or the representation of, uh, of survey, uh, sorry, census data from 1991 to 2001. So in the space of 10 years, these shadings show the spread of Bangladeshi uh, uh, origin settlement 
in the borough of Tower Hamlets in East London. So again, whatever else this is, it's not static. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Uh, so a third criticism is that community research is too positive. It, it tends to give this romanticized sense of uh, everything is very nice and cozy and everyone's uh, you know, kind to children and dumb animals and so on. And uh, why is it that, that it seems to be so much at odds with our experiences? And Jeff Payne asked this question, why are community studies so full of nice people? Uh, which is a very good question to ask. And his answer to that is that, well, in the field, we may find that researchers follow the line of least resistance. If you get the chance to speak to someone who is smiling and welcoming and invites you indoors, you may well follow them up as a participant in your study compared to someone who swears at you and, and says that you're wasting taxpayers' money and so on. So, um, so his sense is that there's a, there's, a, there's a sampling bias in the way in which some people have gone about community research and they've gravitated towards people who, uh, with whom they feel more comfortable and uh, put them some distance between themselves and people with whom they, they have, uh, have differences. Now, the study that came out by Jeff Dench on the, the other East End uh, was a controversial one. It was seen as, as one that was perhaps rather too sympathetic towards uh, white working class views towards minority ethnic groups that were um, rather intolerant. But the point here is, is that they are not presenting a cosy, romanticized view of how things are. They're very much trying to give an account, and in a way, in the context, it couldn't be anything else because the British National Party had, by that time, uh, got uh, some local councillors elected in, in the borough. Um, but they were trying to give an account of the ethnic tensions underpinning the conflict over the allocation of housing in this borough. And as I, as I say, the, 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 the character, the figure who was the heroine of the original 1957 study had by the 21st century become uh, less widely um, sympathised with because it was these, elder, these older women who were the most hostile to the transformation of the borough with the expansion of um, the Bangladeshi population. So certainly not a positive account of community in which everybody knows everybody else and everybody leaves their back doors open and everybody uh, is, is positive about each other. Another example of um, a piece of research that's sort of questioning the idea that community researchers tend to go with, with just one um, perspective is uh, a, a piece of research by Eric Laster and his colleagues in uh, Muncie, Indiana, um, some of you may know in the history of research, the, the, the original study of Middletown by Robert and Helen Lind in the 1920s uh, started a whole series of subsequent studies, the first one done by those two, others done by, by other people. And in this whole succession of studies and re-studies of Muncie, Indiana, um, there is virtually no mention of the fact that a substantial part of the uh, city's population are African Americans. They're virtually written out from the narrative. And the reasons for that are because of the idealization of uh, that Midwestern, um, Middle American community as a, as a white community. So this is a, an interesting study for giving an account of the other side of Middletown, where Eric Laster um, and, uh, and his co-researchers, in a collaborative ethnography, working with community partners, in the city and also working with 12 of his students um, and in, in the process of, uh, of collecting that material managed to produce a fascinating book which uh, amongst other things has the photographs on the cover. I'm afraid that may not be coming out quite as well as it, as it should do um, but I, I think what it's conveying here is that when you do work in collaboration with community partners, lots of issues get uh, raised. I particularly love this picture at the bottom and have often asked uh, people to suggest what is it that the girl on your left has just said to the girl on the right to get that response. Uh, I did actually do this talk in Muncie, Indiana and asked that question and someone put his hand up and he said, oh, she's just saying that uh, the staff at Ball State University, which was their university, uh, have just been offered a huge rise by the principal. So, <laughs> so that's a true story, I should say. Um, and, uh, and that. But the reason I, I think for, for this point about conflict and tension and, and not giving a, a, a rosy view of community is that this top photograph 
produced a lot of discussion in the group about whether it should be included. Did the people whose lives were being portrayed here want that to be amongst the images on the front cover? And there was a lot of discussion about whether it should or shouldn't be there. In the end, it was put there, and it's conveying that race and, and, uh, and, and ethnic divisions have not gone away in uh, the 21st century in uh, middle America. Um, and all credit to Eric and his team for working with people to produce this, what I think is wonderful, uh, account. As I say, the point is that in some ways it is a positive account, but it's not, uh, it's not a cosy, sort of cement sentimentalised, romanticised view. It is community warts and all. Fourthly, too descriptive. So uh, poor community researchers, you've got to feel sorry for them in a way, or for us in a way, in that uh, you deal with one criticism and people come along with another one. So one is to say, well, where's your theory? That there's no... Um, it's all very good that you've described here, you know, what the patterns of owner occupation are and the patterns of employment and the patterns of, uh, of, of kinship formation and so on, but you've got no theory. So uh, here I just want to mention a few examples where people doing research into community have, amongst other things, engaged with theoretical issues. Now, some of you may remember uh, Trevor Phillips coming out with the uh, idea that, that in the UK we are sleepwalking into segregation. And so Lisa Finney and, and Ludie Simpson said, OK, let's, let's test that out. Let's see whether that is, in fact, borne out by looking at census data. Let's see whether we're pulling apart as a society into increasingly segregated and polarised uh, patterns of residential uh, location. And... So in picking up again on 1991 and 2001 census data, um, they look at the, the, through, the, through the idea of the index of dissimilarity. They're able to take on and to show that, uh, that, um, that uh, Trevor Phillips was not correct in his bold statement about how we're sleepwalking into, into uh, segregation. Another example of uh, piece of research in the field of community that is engaging with theory is by uh, Liz Spencer and Ray Powell, uh, where they're looking at personal communities, they're interested in how friendship matters to the way in which we live our lives and the networks that we develop and so on, and they engage with uh, theories of social capital. Now, as a, as a theory, this perhaps is not the most sophisticated, it just suggests that everything is connected to everything else both ways, but at least it's a theory, and you know, it, it's not just description. So well, I suppose if everything was connected to everything else, there should be also some between the two bits at the uh, top left and bottom right corners. Uh, but my point is that, that seriously, they, um, they are looking to understand the significance of what friendship means in the modern world in terms of people's social capital, about advancement and disadvantage in terms of things like uh, knowledge about jobs, about opportunities in relation to housing, or just in general quality of, quality of life. And another example of theory, um, I've got a colleague in, in, here in Edinburgh who, who should remain nameless, but who is not necessarily convinced that everything should start from the works of uh, Pierre Bourdieu. But uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu is famous for many things, including his ideas about distinction and about class and about the way in which uh, we relate to each other in ways which emphasise the importance of our uh, our ability to make ourselves <coughs> set apart and superior by the, the, the way in which we live our, live our lives. This has been taken up and uh, used by uh, a social researcher in um, Stavanger in, in uh, Norway, an oil town, the oil capital of Norway, and what he's doing using multiple correspondence analysis is to, is to use uh, material gathered through surveys to find out about the different groupings that there are. And I, I should apologise for the small scale of this. You'll just have to take my word for it. Uh, I have the book with me in case anyone wants to check, but, but you'll just have to take my word for it. That What he's doing here is showing that there are uh, correspondences between different aspects of things that are portrayed here. So, for example, at the very top, you've got uh, a preference for IKEA furniture, and that corresponds with other things here in the top left quadrant, such as... Uh, wears working clothes at work and that contrasts here I've been told not to walk about too much but at the very bottom here these are people who wear a suit and tie at work so that's currently me um, and we've also got uh, whether people are 
uh, clean and tidy at home or uh, rather untidy at home, uh, whether they're interested in culture or, or not. And then also in here we've got preferences for residing in different parts of the city of Stavanger. So where people live is coming back to this point about how people are looking to locate themselves uh, to live among people like themselves in terms of their culture, in terms of their styles of dress, in terms of their uh, interest in politics and so on. Some of the other things here on the top, um, your top right quadrant are about having uh, strong left-wing attitudes and so on. So uh, perhaps nothing terribly surprising that you know, the strong left-wing attitudes are associated uh, not with wearing a suit and tie at work, but, but nevertheless what he's done here is to use survey materials to give a sense of how we all come together around community, but we also pull apart around community and we make these distinctions based on things like uh, whether we do or don't uh, prefer IKEA furniture. And this was brought home to me last summer when at the craft fair at the end of um, uh, uh, Princess Street, I was admiring a, a, a handcrafted wooden bowl and uh, was about to buy it and said to the person at the stall, um, this will look very nice on my Ikea table, and he said, I'm not going to sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Although good sense prevailed, and he did finally allow me to, 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 to exchange it for money. But uh, he was quite affronted by the idea that his bowl was going to be on an Ikea table. So um, that was a moment that led me back to, this, back to this slide. Finally, too prosaic. In other words, are these rather dull? You know, do, the, do these accounts really leave us excited? Do we, do we kind of say this is unputdownable? Um, and certainly, uh, Ruth Glass's criticism of community studies as the poor sociologists substitute for the, for, for the novel. She had a great line in Put Downs, and that was one of them. Um, and I think that probably is true that you do find yourself sort of wading through and thinking, you know, when's this going to end? Um, but maybe a bit like this lecture. But, uh, but the, the, the point is that I think you know, community researchers have responded to that and have thought about you know, what is it that we're doing, how do we engage with our audiences. Do things have to be um, presented in a particular format, or might we not vary how we present our findings in different ways, and so on? And what she's, uh, and, and, and so what I've got here is, is some responses to uh, Ruth Glass's criticism that actually um, contemporary research has included things like the inclusion of autobiographical material by Jeremy Brent talking about growing up and, and, and living on a, um, on a on an estate in Bristol and a more historical piece of work about gossip and about people's capacity to take each other to court over slander, which is uh, great reading. It's, 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 uh, it's fascinating, the sorts of things that people take as slights against their character that, that they then feel they need to take to court to get redressed for. So uh, whatever else you may think of those studies, they're not prosaic. They are, you know, you want to read on for the, for the, next, for the next case. So in the study that I talked about, um, involving Alice Marr. When we looked at 100 pieces of research broadly in the field of community that published uh, in 2000 or since, what we found is that, yes, interviews are still there. It's the single most uh, commonly used method, but it's by no means the only one. And most of these studies, and we were trying to be not necessarily representative, but we were trying to get a sense of the range of things going on, and what we're finding is that in these 100 studies, most of them are using mixed methods. Most of them are using more than one approach. And there's a, there's a whole different way in which these things can be uh, combined. But we've got discourse analysis, we've got um, online research, we've got mobile methods, we've got um, visual methods and uh, surveys and, and, and so on in there. So my point is, in, in presenting this slide, that, um, that there are fewer people doing research using only one method than was was in my particular case when I did my uh, PhD. And if I were doing my PhD again, and when I'm advising people on their PhDs, I encourage them to think about using more than one method. So the point, I suppose, just before going on to the case, the particular case of mixed methods and then finishing, is that combinations of, of methods are important. They have great potential. And one of the reasons why we need that in community is that it's, it's common to sort of think about community as people having something in common, but of course, people having one thing in common doesn't necessarily mean that they have everything in common. In fact, that's, that's very unusual. And if we want to get at those different types of things that people have in common, then we need, uh, we, we're assisted by having a variety of different uh, methods. Uh, just a brief mention here about a, a, a group I'm um, 
leading in relation to the connected communities research, which is looking at uh, um, encouraging mixed methods because of the argument that uh, research is changing, we're seeing, so the argument goes, uh, the democratization of research, we're seeing increasingly this breakdown, this breaking down of the, the idea that there are researchers and researched populations and, and a crossing of those, uh, those boundaries. I'll come back to that uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, and then also just noting that when we do re-studies, we may well need to think again about the methods that have been used and perhaps think about supplementing them. One of the things I'm about to talk about is a method that was used in the 1970s where young people age 16 were, um, I was going to say asked, I think they were probably told, but anyway, they were invited in uh, their, uh, their classes at school to imagine that they were at the end of their lives and to write an essay about the sorts of things that they would be telling people about what had happened in their lives. And uh, some 140 of these were collected on the Isle of Sheppey in uh, 1978 by Ray Powell. And these are quite, quite fascinating. We've tried to uh, replicate that study, and we have collected some data. But part of the response we've had was people saying, what, write that with a pencil on a bit of paper? Well, why can't we do something like with Big Brother style or whatever? So in our next piece of research, what we're going to be using is collaborative video, because, of course, Things move on, technology changes, and a method that may have been appropriate at one stage isn't necessarily going to be appropriate for others. Um, my colleagues in, in the, uh, in the uh, Scottish Graduate School um, felt that uh, no talk like this would be complete without my mentioning of the Isle of Sheppey, because uh, I do talk about it from time to time. And uh, so I'm just going to finish with, and an, come towards a close by, looking at an exemplar of mixed methods research, which went into uh, a book. There were other things as well, and, and Claire Wallace, who's in the audience here, was um, part, of this, part of this team and has produced some things as well. So uh, she knows, as I say, much more about this particular uh, study th than I do. But it, it's, it's one that I use in my teaching, and, and that's because, as a, an example of what benefits can come from combining methods, it is very thought-provoking. So in a study, and it was conducted over um, something like a decade, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a five minute piece, piece of work, but the re research methods that we used in going into this project included ethnography, um, it included historical demography, looking at patterns of migration to the, uh, to the Royal Naval Dockyards uh, to work, uh, quantitative survey analysis, a one in nine analysis of the households on the Isle of Sheppey. And in addition, uh, there are also uh, some photographs that were used, including some in the book by, by Claire, um, and also these young people's imagined futures essays as well, feeding into this overall account of life in this, um, in this particular context. Now, having said Sheppey, I should just locate it. So Sheppey is this island with the uh, red dot on here in the Thames estuary to the east of London. Uh, when I was speaking earlier about my PhD fieldwork, I come from Kent and, and I was doing my fieldwork in Kent. I never quite got as far as Sheppey to do my farming interviews, although if I had, I expect I'd have found some gates that were rather more forceful than the one that said trespassers will be shot because it's a, it's a blunt speaking place. Um, but anyway, in, in Sheppey, one of the things that uh, uh, one, of the, one of the methods that we used to give this sense of what community was like were these essays, and I just quickly uh, put, put this up. So these are people imagining their futures, and uh, I won't read them fully out, but, but these are people who say things, and you think, gosh, I'm quite surprised that a 16-year-old sees that as their, their, their future. I love this bit at the bottom of the young woman who says, um, you know, she worked in a shoe factory, uh, four years, and then I did a good day's work. I got married without any doubts. So uh, the, these, these, these essays are all archived at the University of Essex Qualidata um, archive, and uh, they are quite fascinating. And, and so as, as I'm talking about branching out my uh, methodological repertoire, I would recommend anybody the joys of archival research, because archives are, whatever else they are, they're not dull places to visit. This is one of the photographs from the book. Um, I particularly like it. it. It conveys, again, quite a lot about the nature of the place. It's 
quite an industrial place, the houses and the, and the uh, industrial um, uh, sites are side by side, and there's the comment here about how um, with the collapse of the apprenticeship system, then other ways of young people learning about uh, trades and so on can be developed. So um, th this is a very Sheppy picture. One of the ones that's not in the book is this, and I apologize for the poor quality, but it's a, it's a, a shot of what was called the bike rush. So in the period when the Royal Naval, Do Royal Naval Dockyard was still open, it closed in 1960, um, the men, and it was largely men who worked there, would come and go by bicycle, and the, uh, the, the, the siren for the end of the shift would go, and these men would go off at, uh, at dinner time for their dinners and then cycle back and so on. I've put it up because in the research that we've done recently on Sheppey, using peer researchers, using people from the local community to gather data, in this case, we we're interested in oral histories. We wanted to talk to older people about their memories of being young in Sheppey uh, in, in the past. And our peer researcher was trying to uh, recruit another participant. And he said, oh, I don't think I've got anything that anyone would be interested in. And she said, well, try me, you know, just, just see how it goes. And he then proceeded to tell her a story about how as a nine-year-old, he had moved with his parents to a news agent's in Sheerness, near to the dockyard. And his job in the morning, each morning, was to stand outside the shop with the newspapers for these various people cycling by. So he had to know who they were and which newspapers they had. And wrapped up inside those newspapers were those customers' cigarettes. So he had to know that this person had 20 woodbines or, or, or whatever it was. And I just read that transcript and it followed on from saying, I don't think I've got anything to say that anyone would be interested in. And I thought, how could anyone not think <laughs> that that's an interesting story? And, uh, and then he produced lots of other things as well. But that's just kind of an example of, of, of the way in which, um, you know, maybe we wouldn't have got that story if we hadn't had a peer researcher. And the story also comes to life by having a picture of the bike rush that he's, that he's describing. So by way of conclusion, just to... Um, avoid overrunning time. What I've been arguing is that community, community research is an example of the value of thinking about methodological pluralism, that there is value in having some people talk about a, a methods as a toolbox and having a variety of tools in the toolbox depending on what you want to do. One of my favourite quotes is by Maxine Rodinson, who has said, no one has a key to fit all locks, which if you think about it is pretty good, uh, you know, pretty useful. If, if someone had a key that fitted all locks, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? But, but the, the serious point would be that no one method um, can necessarily give us the best way in to the study of a particular thing. It depends what you want to find out. It depends what your question is. So having a, a, a variety of methods at our disposal has all sorts of advantages. These um, sets of methods offer researchers flexibility and they may be used separately or, or in combination. And um, the re-studies also tell us that sometimes we need to think about uh, using new methods, because even if we're asking the same questions, the world may have changed in the meantime, a bit like with the collaborative ethnography used to capture young people's Im Im imagined futures. I just want to return to Willowbed Farm, and this will finally allow a bit of audience participation. So this was... Summer 1980, I, a fresh-faced uh, researcher going out and collecting my data, um, and in preparation for this lecture, I, I thought, hmm, maybe I should go back there and see if that sign is still there and get a better picture of it. You know, that would be one possibility. So, question to you, is Willow Bed Farm still a farm? I know at least two of you in the audience know the answer, so you can't answer, but uh, others of you. <laughs> oh, it's just to the south of Ashford. Uh, in Kent, um, but it, it, I can tell you it hasn't been built on, so uh, as in it hasn't been taken over by a housing estate or whatever. Uh, hands up those people who think that it is still a farm. Okay, and hands up those who think it isn't. Okay, so I think most of you think it isn't. Well, in a way you're both right, because <laughs> Rose and I did go back there uh, last summer, 
and we find that it's turned into a furniture farm. <laughs> and it's selling things like garden ornaments. So this is, this is the place to go if you're short of garden gnomes or something. Uh, but much more welcoming than trespassers will be shot. You know, they want you to come in here now. So it is a farm, but is that really a farm if you're then selling furniture rather than growing crops and keeping pigs and, 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 and those sorts of things? So um, we didn't go in and buy any furniture, but uh, maybe we will go back and patronise them for you know, kind of uh, keeping things alive. But that's just an example of how I think you, know, you, you can get a sense of how the world is changing, where some people who used to make their living out of farming now make their living out of selling furniture. And just the final slide is just to note that uh, there are, of course, various acknowledgements because I am here today only because I've worked, been fortunate enough to work uh, with a whole variety of, uh, of, of people as parts of teams. My long suffering, I did think about putting long suffering in there, long suffering supervisor was Howard Newby. Um, and he, uh, he, he sort of kept the faith, and I did finally, finally get there. Um, I also want to acknowledge my current colleagues here in Edinburgh in the Scottish Graduate School of Social Science, in the, um, in the subject area of sociology. Also my colleagues in the National Centre for Research Methods, mainly based in Southampton, and also in various places around the country in the Connected Communities um, Consortium. And of course, many, many people in between. So I'm not gonna name individual names, but I am making the point that uh, this journey that I've had to get here has been one that wouldn't have been possible without all the teamwork that I've had the benefit of uh, along the way. So thanks very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. I know there are other people in the audience who want to talk to Graham, but they can do so in a, in a more informal setting in a moment. And just uh, allow me, if you will, just to propose a vote of thanks to, to, to Graham. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's come to this lecture. Inaugural lectures as a sort of shifting community of people um, who are in and out of the inaugurees um, lives, as it were, and, and, and it's never complete because there are so many people outside this room to whom we're connected in so many different ways who are also part of your, your academic um, development who, who doubt that, as, as you say, you, you don't want to invidiously pick anyone out. Um, I want to thank everyone who came to the lecture, whether that's uh, colleagues from within the university, the principal and the vice principal, um, colleagues from, uh, from SPS in Edinburgh Sociology and from other universities in Edinburgh and elsewhere in Scotland and outside Scotland as well, and for whatever work of life, including farming, you might have come to us from. Uh, that was a, a, a virtuoso uh, performance uh, developing a, a, a defence if you will, but that sounds too defensive, uh, of, your, uh, of your field of community research and providing us with many handles and clearly providing a lot of uh, uh, stimulation. There was a tremendous amount of stuff going on in the, in, in the responses, the questions and the responses there, which, which lead me to believe that you're not going to be short of ideas for proposals and doubtless this will be successful research proposals for funding um, in the future. So, um, just before I, I ask you once more to thank um, Graham in, in, in the normal way, can I just say that everyone is invited to come along to a, a reception now where there will be food and drink, both of them, um, but unfortunately not in, a, in, in the, the closest venue to this one where I, I understand there's a, um, a, a meeting being held this evening, but in the McEwen Hall lecture, um, the McEwen Hall reception room, which is accessible off the uh, the medical school, the old medical school quad um, at the back of the McEwen Hall, basically. Um, I think the idea would be to follow two people who definitely know their way here, there, Dorothy Meal and <laughs> Professor O'Shea, um, and, uh, and, and others uh, such as, I'm sure, uh, Fiona Mackay, who know their way there, and so on and so forth. Uh, to, hopefully we'll still be able to go out the back of, of, of Old College, where we were when you came back. You don't know whether they've closed it in the meantime. You've forbidden it, have you? <laughs> Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to go out the back of, me, uh, of Old College, which will make the walk a little uh, shorter rather than having to go all the way around. So thank you very much, uh, Graham. Fantastic uh, lecture, and let's thank him again in the normal way. Thank you. 
This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.